Good morning, everybody. It is um, the, the, uh, the, the beginning of September. August is over. We talked about this last week, RP. We are coming into Memorial Day weekend. Um, we're, we're fortunate to have a guest today. Dr. Mary Travis Bassett is with us. I'm going to introduce you, Mary, after we run this. Okay, welcome, uh, Dr. Bassett, Mary. What would you like me to call you? Uh, you? You can call me Mary. That's fine. Okay. Hi, Mary. But so, I, so, I put a lot of years into that doctor. So. Well, uh, of course, and I, I'm I'm more than happy to call you doctor. And I know that because I'm actually looking at a whole list of things. Um, currently, you're the director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard right. University. Yeah. Um, You've been in public health for 30 years. Uh, we, we, um, we're so lucky to have you here today and, and thank you for coming. As I mentioned to you earlier, for about a year and a half, we've been trying to understand, better understand COVID um, for ourselves, but more importantly for people who, um, who really wanna get it. And, and I think in the end, we say that we exist and live in what we call the great bewilderment. Uh, great bewilderment is some combination of information overload nefarious actors in the information sphere, confusion, um, you know, the, the acceleration of history on a mass scale in a whole variety of places that sort of puts us in this place. So we're trying to be something where um, people can find solace in both some mix of information and the heart or the human side of sort of what's happening in the world. So that, that's kind of our goal. Um, anyway, you were also the commissioner uh, of health and mental hygiene in New York City for four years, more than 8 million people. Um, the, I'm fascinated by that, and I'd love to understand that job better. We've had police commissioners, or on, com commissioners on here at certain times, and I think that kind of a job and the kind of job that we're talking about within New York City, you know, to go to bed every night worrying about the health of 8 million people has got to be pretty intimidating. Mm -hmm. In, you know, in the case of a police commissioner, the safety of, of them, and I'm sure there's a lot of crossover there. Um, and I think there's, these are the kinds of things that many of us take for granted. But one of the themes we've been um, focused on over the last year and a half is that in many ways, COVID became an x-ray on our culture and our society mm -hmm. that allowed us to look at it from a new point of view. Um, so I think that's uh, very real. Um, what I'm going to do, if it's okay, and, and I, we always let our guests, it's up to them. I want to talk just briefly about Afghanistan before we move into okay. COVID, because there's a lot going on over there. Um, you know, one of the things, RP, I, I had shared with you guys that that graphic that sort of outlines all the equipment that we left in, in, in um, Afghanistan. And it was another one of those moments. And, and you know, we, we were, Mary, we've had a variety of shows that sort of looked at all the issues related to what happened so rapidly and so depressingly within Afghanistan. Um, and some of it is just sorting through bad information. And it does seem to be the case, RP, that the graphic that I sent you was bad information, that we certainly spent a lot of money on a lot of gear. And they certainly ended up with some of the gear, but nowhere near the kind of gear that we saw in that graphic yesterday. And the last thing I'll say, and I'd, I'd invite either one of you guys to comment, I'm very bummed about this whole uh, about what unwound in Afghanistan. It was interesting that Ann Coulter like has Joe's back, like Ann Coulter, very conservative kind of firebrand type, thinks what Joe Biden did was, was historic and heroic and he did all the right things in the ways that he left. I was sort of surprised about that, but when you read her logic, I guess in her set of logic, it makes sense. I'm not actually taking a position on what Joe Biden did was good or bad in this, in this exact moment. But I will say this, I sort of sit at this place where I think, man, when I was a kid, a little kid, I remember saying to my dad, have we ever lost a war? And he said, well, we're losing one right now. And it was Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it seems to me that as, as on the international scene, we've been lost for a long time. Now, I know that's a bit of an overstatement, but I'm not sure what the plan ever was in Afghanistan now. And I'm not sure what our plan is going forward. 
and it leaves me kind of broken hearted. Anyway, I just said a lot. That tends to be how we open, but RP, Mary, please jump in in any way you like. Well, you know, this is not something that I know about except as a citizen. And of course, yeah. the images that we're seeing of people left behind and stranded are, are wrenching. Um, I, I guess, you, you know, uh, it, it it seemed like a story for which there was no good ending. Any, uh, and, and it's been like that for a very long time. And when you think of the number of people whose lives, American lives that were lost in Vietnam compared to Afghanistan, it's uh, on a whole different scale, right? It was, yeah. I don't know, what was it? 50, 60,000 yeah. in Vietnam and 2,500 in Afghanistan. But of course, the people of Afghanistan paid a much, much higher price yeah. and are still paying it. So I, I don't, it's hard for me to feel like like we did, we did that small country any good. Um, and, um, and of course, as you know, in our in my field, uh, people who've collaborated with Afghanis had uh, had Afghani students that we feel some personal obligation to try and support the people who with whom we once worked. But that's really all I, I can, can say about it right now. It, it, it's just not it. it there's just no way that this was a good story. Um, and, and the people of Afghanistan have paid the highest price. Yeah. Mary, that was, thank you for that. Um, just some quick thoughts. So first, uh, to the point you were making, Tom, about all the material that certain media outlets want us to believe are now in the hands of the Taliban. One of my, really, one of the columnists I like a lot is Max Boot, who is a former... Republican, neocon largely, um, and, uh, you know, semi-controversial columnist, but I like his work. And I liked a lot what he did today. He wrote a tweet and said, I made a mistake. I tweeted someone else's information about all this material that now allegedly is in the hands of the Taliban. And I was wrong. And it was, I should have checked my facts. And I thought that was interesting. And that obviously is no surprise. On all these topics, there are, there are, you know, merchants of dishonesty for different reasons. And that's a story that people are putting out there. I was talking to a friend about this and, and I mentioned, you know, he said, why did we leave all that stuff there? I said, well, we didn't leave stuff there. This, these are weapon systems that we had given to the Afghan military and the Afghan military just evaporated and the weapon systems were there. And he said, my God, I, I never had heard that aspect of it. So I did want to share with everybody. These weren't left in U.S. government warehouses with the doors unlocked. These had already been given to the US, to the Afghanistan military who had been trained on it and commissioned to them. And then those guys evaporated. And the weapon systems were there. Third point I make on that and last is um, they're not flying Blackhawks and F-16s tomorrow. These things, uh, many of them require intense maintenance for, for what was taken from the Afghanistan military. They're not going to be in the hands of the Taliban for very long. They can't operate many of them. Um, nonetheless, it is yet another example of why this was such a tragic and, and horrendous evacuation. The tactics of the evacuation were so poor. To something you said, Mary, and it's the second word you used, which is the images. And I think that maybe we can get something positive out of this, which is we all, all of a sudden, paid attention to Afghanistan. And it's a place of tremendous uh, sorrow and suffering for a long time, and it's now going to continue again under the Taliban rule. And there are a number of places like that in the world, not to diminish one from the other. And America can make a big difference in those places. But I think what we've learned, and I go back to George Kennan's views on you know, how to build Pax Americana, what we've learned is we, can't, we really just can't do nation building. And we can't move in, occupy a country and try to change them. I'm not saying it's not worth trying. And I'm not saying it's not worth trying to kick the Taliban out. But America has just never had success at doing that ever. And we should stop trying. I'm not saying we should stop trying to intervene in human rights abuses. Uh, but the image aspect, Mary, I think is, is fascinating, right? Because everyone's looking at this now and everyone's paying attention to it now. So let's hope the lesson that we carry forward is is one of, wow, we really should intervene in these countries somehow. We should try to fix human rights abuses around the world, which is something that you've worked on in the health space. Uh, to me, those are very intertwined for a long time. Um, and uh, But let's not make this silly overreach again where we think we're going to go occupy a country and turn it into something different than what it's been for 10,000 years. You know, maybe there's a transition here, and I don't want to. I don't want to 
work too hard on it because maybe I'm wrong. It feels to me because so there are a number of Americans still in Afghanistan, right? And no, I don't I, know why. Say that again. Yeah, I don't know how many, but there definitely are are some. Well, I, I, I just just the, I don't think as far as Americans in Afghanistan who wanted to leave, uh, who didn't get out, I think the number is not very high. Mm-hmm. I think allies of ours, translators and others, we'd like to rescue who are in per- grave danger. I think that number is still in the tens of thousands or more. Yeah. So there are still a number of people who who good good Americans should want to save from that country. And that gets you to your underground railroad kind of moment, which is where we are finding, you know, a lot of operations going on right now in Afghanistan. And that's heavily ongoing, I, I assume. I mean, it, it, like Biden himself and that you know, the story of his interpreter, these kinds of things are ongoing. Yeah. Uh, every day I'm talking to someone on the ground in Afghanistan trying to move people through what is now being called sort of underground railroad. It's not quite there. Not right. I know the New York Times and possibly the New the Washington Post published stories about how they set up, uh, uh, you know, uh, a network uh, working independently to get their translators and interpreters uh, out. So, Dr. Bassett, you spent uh almost 15 years am i right more than 15 years in zimbabwe yeah yeah yeah. um i'm curious how that led and and is there a direct link between the work you did in zimbabwe and the and the role that you took on in new york i mean there's got to be obviously some um, some connection there but but the other thing i wanted to talk about is does that also relate to your position and your belief that Healthcare is in effect a, a right, a human right, and um, perhaps a place where America, you know, there's certain things we do well, but maybe this is one of the places that we continue to come up short. I don't know if there's a connection there, so I'm asking. Oh, that well, I would hope that my life is somehow connected, but I, I, I have had the privilege of, um, of having an unusual working life, which after I finished my training, which is kind of interminable. Uh, for people who uh, get trained in medicine. Uh, I, um, I I went to live in Zimbabwe and took a job at the University of Zimbabwe Medical School. Uh, it was 1985 when I first went there and uh, the country became independent in 1980. It was one of the last countries in Africa to become independent and had been a settler colony. And in that way, many in many ways, um, much more developed than than many other um, many other countries in Africa, and I, I I really did learn some of the most important lessons that uh, I have ever learned about public health, and that is when a government is committed to improving the health of its population, that enormous health advancements can occur. So, in the first um, I'd say about uh, ten years that I was there. Zimbabwe halved its infant mortality rate, tripled its immunization coverage, had a ministry of health that was led by people all in their 30s who stood up to emissaries from global institutions and said that they had a a pretty good idea of how to improve the health of their country and they were right. And uh, and it was a privilege to, to have been part of that and then um, and then things changed. And so I also learned how a government can really be harmful to the health of its people. Um, and uh, that some of the gains can be rapidly reversed. And, and not all of these were um, changes that were uh, chosen by the government of Zimbabwe as a number of very damaging um, economic programs were basically foisted on the country in return for access to credit, which was badly needed. So I learned a lot there that I think uh, I took with me when I became health commissioner in New York. And I guess it underlies my fundamental belief that public health is a responsibility of government. What, what was the key? What, what, was, what created the, the default um, after 10 years? Why did it go south? Oh, what happened? Oh, you know, I, I, I don't know how interested your your listeners will be. Zimbabwe is a really small country, but, um, but I could talk about it a lot. And what one of the key things in my view was the adoption of what were known as structural adjustment programs, and these were programs that were promulgated by the World Bank and the uh, International Monetary Fund that include a package 
of actions, devaluing the currency, relieve, um, re removing price controls, um, uh, and, um, and reducing labor protections, um, all of which really were intended to lead to cheaper exports and an export-driven uh, uh, economic development. And it, uh, it meant that universities were not really considered good investments because they don't make any money. The whole social sector uh, was not considered uh, worthy of the levels of investment that it had received. Zimbabwe always spent its largest single budget share on education, for example, uh, had one of the most literate populations in, in, in Africa. Uh, so these decisions were really damaging um, and the government acceded to them. And then we saw corruption become much more apparent. Um, so I saw these as related. I'm not a social scientist or an economist, but what happened in the health sector was introduction of user fees, um, the underfunding of the healthcare delivery system. Um, and um, it, you know, it, it was a, a combination of external and internal um, uh, uh, forces that you know led to an increasingly despotic um, national government uh, under the then uh, president Robert Mugabe. I mean, when I left my university job, I was earning two hundred U.S. dollars a month. Uh, so you really can't expect somebody to live on that, and nobody was expected to live on it uh, if they had a, the choice. So you had a faculty that was moonlighting. At being uh, at being ac academics and making a living somewhere else, it was extremely damaging. Did um, you, you a lot of your work is in health inequality, and um, mm -hmm. were there specific observations you made during that time as well um, that relate in any way, or maybe not, to life here in America and how certain people are prioritized over others? Well, I was also in Zimbabwe during a major AIDS epidemic, uh, and uh, there was no doubt that that was track, tracking through the inequalities of a long, a long, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic and, and gender uh, role. So uh, I absolutely learned a lot about how people's resources for their everyday life uh, you know, created their vulnerability to disease and their ability to avoid it. So I took that with me to New York City. Um, that and the idea that, um, you know, that you need to have communities involved in the pursuit of their own health, that uh, we need to have a policy environment that is permissive and we need to mobilize communities also to engage uh, and be partners in, in, in improving the health of their neighborhoods. Okay, and in your time in New York, were you guys able to do that? Yeah, we started these things, which were then called district public health offices, and then and we branded, I'm not good at that kind of stuff, by some of our younger um, smarter people called neighborhood health action centers. And then of course we pursued, um, you know, a lot of the leading causes of death and that's putting aside the microbes that we are confronting now uh, are related to um, unhealthy food environments. And so we undertook a, a whole range of, of actions around making food healthier and also limiting exposure to tobacco. So all of those things, um, the role, the importance of government being, you know, going beyond the idea of educating people to make smart choices, to make it possible for people to, uh, uh, you know, to make good choices. Um, that was something that I really learned in Zimbabwe. It's relevant to what we're facing now, right? With COVID uh, as well. You know, yeah. I produced a movie. Yeah called um, Apple Pushers. I don't know if you ever saw it, but it was about food deserts in New York City. Oh, really? We had an Apple Day once in the New York oh, really? the lobby of our health department where we brought in like all these, you know, New York State is a big apple producing state. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> yeah. So at the time, 
and I'm going to blow the, the exact terminology here, but you, you got all the food cart guys, and basically there was a limited number of licenses available to them. That's right. However, if you, for some period of time, sold certain kinds of foods, in this case, yeah. fresh fruits and vegetables, that's well, right. there was, so that's what the film was about. And, oh, and, really? And, yeah. yeah, and the reason I'm telling this story is that by getting on the ground, where I'm going with all of this is, we've been talking about this throughout, but the, we talked about the X-ray on culture and society that COVID provided, good or bad, many of it, much of it bad. Mm -hmm. There does seem to be massive inequity in sort of what, what, were the, what were the outcomes? What happened? What did COVID show? Who did it hurt the most and how? Mm -hmm. And part of what, you know, in my case, making this film, but to be on the ground and to see these things, because you were talking about, you know, outreach, the, I mean, my words, as I remember what you said, outreach, community, connectedness. Mm -hmm. These are good words. Mm -hmm. The challenge is they are really hard things to do, to actually execute upon. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we can sit on TV and let's be honest, many of us became isolated and, and disconnected in many ways from the rest of the world, certainly in a physical sense by virtue of COVID. And as we're looking in, it's very hard to understand. It's very hard to understand and even to empathize to a certain extent because it's, I guess it's easy to empath empathize with certain images and stories on TV. Mm. Nonetheless, it's very hard to understand, to actually understand the reality of what's going on in the ground in this realm. I mean, RP and I did a show last summer. Um, we had a woman on who runs the YWCA uh, outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we were talking about the isolation that kids are feeling because they're distance learning. And one of the things she reminded us, well, in our district, they're not learning at all. Yeah. Schools just shut down for months. And I was kind of shocked. And I thought like, I thought, wow, it's on, it's, it's interesting and sad the extent to which there's so many things we don't know, we don't understand, and we're frankly just unaware of. And so the idea of, you know, being in charge of the health of 8 million people on a day in and day out basis. So it's got to be an, an intimidating thing. And it's also got to be something that I would imagine you come with lots of ideas, but it's the execution of those, those ideas that really becomes the hard part. Well, it, everything you say is true. And, uh, <laughs> but you, you know, these are, are great jobs and uh, New York City is lucky in having a truly outstanding world-class health department. Uh, and uh, so these are things that, that aren't, aren't done alone. And I was really felt rewarded by how beginning a conversation about racism at the New York City Health Department unleashed so much creativity uh, among the health department staff and uh, led to programming that at one person, a health commissioner could, would never have come up on, with on her own. Uh, but was the output of, uh, of a whole 6,000 strong uh, department. So these are problems that are big, but they are problems that we can tackle. And as COVID, I would argue to you, shows, they're problems that we just have to tackle. Uh, the inequality between neighborhoods, the, um, the fact that we know too little about each other's lives, right? And uh, most many of our cities are very deeply segregated. I, I so many things to talk about, but I'm just wondering, <laughs> just, you know, dangerous to have a, 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 a tiny formation of the thought and then let it pass my lips. Um, we're designed, our brains are designed for, and I, I buy it, you know, to socialize and live in a small group, in a tribe, right? Dunbar's number, 120 people, 150 people. And that's what nominally we're best at, right? Or, you know, the, the, the decade, the, 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 the century thousands of years of evolution of our brain lead us to be best at socializing in groups of 100 to 150 people. And I wonder if part of the massive challenge we're having here, mm. um, which really gets to expanding our circles of empathy and understanding mm. that maybe I don't have to have a stack of lucre this big and I can pass it over to someone else or that their life does matter and not just mine and not just people who look like me. You know, it's an axiomatic point I'm making, but it just that's what our brains are designed for. And we have to move past it. Right. Like we're, we're very tribal animals and it's really hard to. And I'm just I'm keying off something you said, Mary, about, you know, understanding other people. And yeah. we're just not good at that. Yeah. And and so then when we try to right, like 
because we're curious. And, and of course, you can, pa- you can surpass your animal instinct. When we try to do so, when we turn to the sources available to us, what do we find? We find media that is now the economic model of all media, social and the, the traditional media, is to be merchants of anger and to be merchants of distrust. So when we do try to surpass, you know, our tribal biological instincts and expand our view to people who don't look like us and sound like us, then when we go to look out that window and it happens to be a screen, um, we're greeted by people profiteering off of making us afraid about looking at other people and afraid of the world around us. I mean, it's, maybe it's just that simple. Well, I, I got to see a lot of really good stories um, as health commissioner in New York. I, I We had, you know, my tenure there, I uh, was really uh, characterized by a series of microbes. I missed COVID, but we had Ebola, we had Legionnaires, we had the threat of Zika. Uh, but, uh, I, and of course, my own training was as in chronic diseases. I'm an internal medicine a person, not an infectious disease person. So, uh, but nonetheless, um, one day when I was going to see the public health engineers in the health department, um, and these are nerdy people. Uh, They're the ones who watch the x-ray machines and stuff like that. And I saw all these photographs of children in swimming pools. And I thought, well, what? Why do they have these pictures up? I was going there to make sure they were inspecting cooling towers uh, the way I wanted them to. And, and, uh, and, and I see all these photographs and it turned out that they investigated swimming pool deaths. And uh, they, with, there's a huge racial disparity in, in swimming pool, not just beaches, but swimming pool deaths and black children being far more likely uh, to die. Fortunately, it's rare, but the disparity is very large, eightfold, I think it was. Yeah, it's more so that, than almost any other racial disparity. Yeah. So they um, so they decided that they would get lifeguards from the parks department, swimming pools in the schools, get donation of swimming suits and other goggles and all the floats that I saw in the photographs, and have a swimming program in neighborhood parks public schools. And they pointed out that, of course, there were swimming lessons offered by the Parks Department on a first come, first serve basis. But who benefits from first come, first serve? It's not going to be the kids in these neighborhoods, um, because their parents are working two or three jobs already, and, uh, you know, won't get to it. So, you know, they did this. And, um, and so I, I don't think that we should underestimate the capacity to regenerate empathy. Uh, but you're right, the images that we see are, don't often aren't helpful in doing that. I, I love the way you just brought, I mean, just my blood pressure went down as you started to tell a story and I saw it and I was there and, and then you concluded with a great line, the capacity to regenerate empathy. And um, and, and you began with maybe what the solution is, and that's what you do, Tom, right? Get mm-hmm. past your screen, mm-hmm. go out and meet real people and see what they're doing, and then regenerate your, your optimism in, uh, in fellow humans, which gets just drained by the hatred mm-hmm. amp- amplification of media. Regenerate your optimism and um, regenerate your empathy. But you, get, you can't, and of course, COVID, by definition, you know, separated us, right? Um, and so maybe that is, you know, maybe not maybe, clearly that is a reason why uh, the hatred and division's gone up. We literally are divided for reasons of this microbe. Yeah. You know, as I think about what you guys are just talking about, and I, by the way, I felt exactly the way you did, RP, as you were telling that story, Mary. I really did. Thank you. I'll have to send a note to the guy who, who was the originator of it. Uh, well, and I'll, I'm going to equate it to what I've said about Afghanistan is, that, you know, a lot of this is just headline BS. And, and I, I want to say that before I say what I'm about to say. But, you know, we spent two trillion dollars. We spent 20 years. A lot of people died. By the way, don't ever say blood and treasure. It drives me crazy when people say that because it just diminishes. It, it turns it into a poem. And it's like, no, these are you're talking about deaths 
and money, right? And it's it's intense. Anyway, and you hear it all the time, and I'm like, that's a throwaway line. Sorry, okay, all right. <laughs> well, I know, well, I, well, I know I a lot of people say it, and there's something about it where I'm like, I'm thinking like, wow, like blood and treasure. <laughs> the, you're talking about deaths and people, you know, and money. Anyway, mm -hmm. I, well, I'm I'm trying to say something different here. There's this part of me that looks at what happened in Afghanistan and says, guys, we got to sit down at the table and rethink everything about what we think it means to be an American, because this seems like it was a really bad plan. And it would be helpful if we knew what the plan was. Like the plan is, bang, then we'd all feel better. And I think in the same vein, because I struggle with, and I don't struggle with it from the point of view of like whether or not I believe in it, I struggle with it in terms of what does it mean? And I'm, I'll, you'll see where I'm going here. Healthcare is a right. That sounds good to me. That sounds like, I wanna get behind that. But I have two questions. One of them is, doesn't it make sense that as Americans, if we're going to have a government and if we're going to sort of cooperate together, which by the way, I believe we should and, and we obviously do, because we are, we have one, um, wouldn't we put health right at the top? Like right at the top. And then my question would become, well, what do we mean? And I wish we would say it, I'm making this up. Uh, a heart rate and a healthy diet for every American, whatever it is, whatever it is. So we knew that we were on a team, that we're going to care for each other. And this is some sense of what we believe that means. And can't we share those narratives? Because might, if we might, if we do, and I, just in this week, my brother today, he, he, he has a cancer that has just spread and he's got to go in for treatments for two years and today was his very first day and i got tested for the same cancer and last night as i was lying in bed i saw my results i'm okay it's a genetic thing and i was okay for now and 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 so you 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 start to feel when, when all of us deal with the healthcare system right in, in different times and in different ways but what a massively important important thing and so, Mary, as I say that, am I just speaking idealistically and I'm the late, latest bozo who all of a sudden focused on healthcare for a moment? Or is there hope and can there be hope? And can we use COVID perhaps as a way to say, look, you know, eight times as many, I guess, black people die as white people in pools. Well, let's look at that from the point of view of COVID and let's ask ourselves why and what might we do so that we don't do Afghanistan again and we don't do COVID again. Yeah. You know, the um, so there's a lot of stuff in what you just said. Um, the first thing that I think of, because I work in public health, is that uh, very often when people think about the right to health, they interpret it as the right to health care. And I think of it more broadly as the right of each of us to have our highest attainable state of health. Uh, of course, there are genes and there's bad luck. And it sounds like that has affected your brother. Uh, so we can't ever ensure that everybody will be healthy all the time. We know that that's not possible, but everyone should be able to uh, get as healthy as they can be. And that takes access to healthcare. And it also takes the ability to have the other resources for health. So I, I think of those sort of as a bifurcation uh, all of us need health care as part of having access to a healthy life. And the United States is really an outlier among wealthy countries in not having universal um, health care coverage. It's really pretty stunning, even with the Affordable Care Act, which has been so hotly contested. We left millions of people without health care insurance and uh, still rely on a system where people get their health care coverage mainly through the, being a working person. Um, and so if there was ever a time with the, the economic impact of COVID and the job losses that have occurred, to see that this link between employment and health insurance is, you know, is just too, is too uncertain for too many people, uh, I would have hoped that it would be in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, where you would hope that everybody would feel confident that they could seek medical care. Um, uh, that would be better for all of us, right? Uh, not to have people who are sick with COVID uh, staying at home. Uh, but um, so I, you know, I've, um, for all my working life as a physician, have favored 
uh, having everybody have access to health insurance. And it's a, it's a, a real question why the United States doesn't do that. We pay for it, um, but we don't get it. Uh, our budget for public health insurance is what many countries spend on their entire health insurance budget. So uh, per, per capita. So, and then there's the whole thing about having the right to a healthy life. And, um, and, and there, I think COVID sort of pulled back the curtain too uh, on the levels of poverty, crowding, uh, employment insecurity. These things make us vulnerable. And they're not, they're not easy to fix, but they're fixable. And uh, I think that COVID has been a wake up call. And of course, the murder of George Floyd, as you said in your introductory remarks, um, also you know, brought to the fore the, the way in which uh, excess deaths occur because of encounters with police. Every year in the United States, a thousand people lose their lives. They're disproportionately. Um, uh, people of color, disproportionately black men who are also less likely to be armed than other victims. So these things have converged. And I, you know, I know that it's, we've been talking about how grim it all is, but I actually am feeling more hopeful than I have in a long time uh, about the willingness to sort of collectively pursue change. So, so, so in other words, and we talked a little bit about this last fall mm -hmm. as well. You know, it'd be helpful too, by the way, because we haven't done this. E either one of you, it, it, can we tell the story of why, or just what, what are the indicators that suggest this is a group of people who got the more raw end of the deal within COVID, because I think that would be helpful. And then within that, I think what you're saying is because we came to learn these things so intimately, perhaps, by more clearly identifying the problem. It's the way addicts get healthy. They understand the problem and they admit to the problem and now they're on their way. Is that part of what you're saying? That we've looked at these problems, we know these are problems and it does seem to be the case that people are more willing and, and seemingly actively taking action um, to fix these things. Am, am I right about that? And can yeah, I think so. Out? I mean, I, I, was, I'm, I was remembering when we the deaths from COVID first started to be reported. And I, I was just looking at the number, we're headed to 650,000 deaths. So the first death, if I remember, was at the end of February uh, of, uh, of 2020. So it wasn't that long ago. And uh, as not the CDC, which was a little bit missing in action in all of this, our federal uh, public health agency, but local jurisdictions. The first one I remember was Wisconsin. Uh, the city of Milwaukee, um, the state data showed that um, of the first, the uh, first 15 deaths, um, don't, uh, don't hold me to these numbers, but it was something like that. Um, half of them had been in the city of Milwaukee and all of those were among people classified as black. So uh, this was in March. Um, and so very early on, before many of us really knew what we should be doing to protect ourselves other than not leaving the house, uh, we were seeing these huge racial disparities in who was dying. And they have borne out uh, with, uh, so that the, the risk of, of death was sort of between two and three fold higher for people who were uh, uh, black, uh, Latinx or indigenous. Uh, there were also really, high rates on, on, on the, uh, uh, among um, Native American Indians. So, you know, that was, we couldn't really ascribe that to personal behavior and not, you know, being reckless, which was uh, the usual explanation that has been offered for these racial ethnic differences because nobody really knew how, how to, how to um, you know, protect ourselves. There was no vaccine. Uh, it was a brand new virus. And these were basically exposing pre-existing inequities. Who had jobs where they, you know, were working under crowded conditions where they uh, were likely to transmit at work? Who was going home to crowded households where they were likely to transmit at home? riding on tran crowded transport where they also might get infected. So, you know, uh, that the initial um, numbers uh, showed very, very early 
uh, this inequity. And then there was the inequities in, in the likelihood of dying uh, if you got infected, higher rates of obesity and heart disease and so on. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, I, I think COVID really pulled the curtain back on the on the right to health uh, in our society and 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 we got an even uh, sort of more intimate view of of the unequal right to life uh, with the murder of George Floyd. So those are those you talked about um, this right to what what's the term you use right to health care right to health I use the right to health right to health. And because so, you need to have both a healthy life. And part of that is when you get sick, you have to have access to care. And there's important things your doctor can advise you to do, uh, you know, but um, you need also um, to have a life that allows you to stay healthy. Okay. And then, and part of what you're saying with the, the question of obesity and the higher death mm -hmm. rates relates to, I'm going to guess on some, some part it's education, in some yeah. parts it's access. Yeah. which is it, it, at least two things. One of them is, and, and as I mentioned with this documentary I made, one of the things that you learn is that there literally are massive areas of cities where there are no fresh fruits or vegetables available right. at all. And, and it has nothing to yeah. do with... It's not a choice to live in a place, you know, where uh, nobody chooses to go live in a neighborhood so that I never have to see a veg fruit or vegetable. That's not a choice that people make. And, and in the same vein, by the way, RP knows I always go off on this. Um, one of the things that you that you learn is that people it costs less to feel full at McDonald's than it does at a supermarket. That goes back to the farm bill. That goes back to corn. That goes back to fillers. Anyway, I could go on and on about this yeah, one. This one me makes too. me crazy. But the yeah. point is, when those carts were released within the city, they became very popular and it worked yeah. very well. So it wasn't about demand. Some people no. may think like it's about demand. No, it's actually more about supply. Than it is about demand, and it was very powerful. But this is opening my eyes quite a bit because it's sort of the funnel of things that lead into this question of health. And then once COVID showed up, we were exposed that, oh, that this is a multi dimensional challenge to health among certain communities that are predominantly inhabited by people of color. People of color. And, and, and yeah, you know, I mean, it's just an obvious, right, that people don't choose to live in poor segregated neighborhoods because like it, it's they think it's nicer there um you know i think people don't put on their list i want it to be like unsafe to go out at night to have parks that aren't maintained to have no supermarkets uh you know <laughs> that's not what people uh people are looking for uh but that's the the kind of social geography of our of our our cities and rural areas too have their own issues, right? Many of them have no hospital nearby, small uh, rural hospitals can't, you know, make it financially. Uh, all, you know, Main Street has been gobbled up by big box stores. So there's issues in rural America as well. Dangerous roads, yeah. no lights on roads. Um, I did some of my growing up in Milwaukee and I was surprised to learn, though it's obvious when you see it, that it at one time recently, meaning it might still be, but it certainly was in the last two decades, Milwaukee was the most segregated city in America. Right. Uh, which you wouldn't think of as a you know Midwestern country, right. cities aren't supposed to be like that. That's supposed to be down south, right? Right. Um, yeah. I and I want to make sure we get back to why you're more hopeful now. Um, yeah. Before we do that, I wanted to do, you know Tom, I I like the bridge you're building between your despondency about Afghanistan, your, it's, it sounds like part of what you're pinning that, you're blaming part of that on and you're curious about is like, did we have a strategy there or not? And if we did, why didn't we know it? And um, you can ask a similar thing sort of about COVID and you can look at different countries' responses. And again, you, you might come out on the same end of that equation, which is in Afghanistan, um, I think you're exactly right. We had this ongoing mission creep, never well defined, never described to the American people, never told in stories. Um, Admiral Stavridis, who's one of my favorite military thinkers, and I have a quote here by him. He said, across multiple administrations, this is Afghanistan now, mm -hmm. we failed to communicate why our presence in Afghanistan was still useful and what benefit the U.S. and our allies derived from the expenditures of, sorry, Tom, lives and treasure. And 
that um, that you know now the thing is everyone says and it makes it just sort of feels right to say 20 years of commitment no value it's actually wrong right there there were there were thousands probably millions of positive stories in Afghanistan during the the 20 years now there wasn't 20 years where we controlled the country and all of a sudden everything was Taliban free and Jeffersonian democracy. There were pieces of control and parts of control over time longitudinally, but we were able to give lots of opportunities to lots of people. And the example that I like is that I think it's called Herat University, um, which in the beginning of the American occupation had zero women, now has 50% women as their their students, right? So there, there actually were... And, and I told you before about the story, my friend Roger Pardo um, uh, as a as a sergeant in the Special Forces sitting on top of the governor's office, I think in Kandahar, maybe Kabul, watching children flying kites again, you know, after the Taliban had flown, had, had left. So there were, there were some positive stories, but we didn't hear those in America. They weren't taught to us as stories. We didn't learn about it. We didn't pay attention. We put down the, the kite runner and we ignored what was going on there, partly because the U.S. government didn't want to tell the story to the populace because we couldn't, we weren't really there for the nation building. We were there for the counterterrorism. And if we were there for counterterrorism, which we had to be, we thought, then we had to have DOD doing it, not the people who nation build. So uh, the bridge over to, to COVID-19, mm-hmm. again, we had 50 different leadership organizations here, 50 states versus one federal leadership. You were referring to this earlier, Mary, massive mistake, unbelievable mistake. Federal government, the, the U.S. is not designed to do it that way, in my estimation, having worked on federal pandemic response plans. And all of a sudden you have this atomization of 50 governors get to figure out what to do. You now have 50 different agenda. And of course, the disease doesn't constrain itself to state borders. Right. And so in some states, when you have the lethality kind of demographic dimensions you were describing, Mary, which were largely older, largely poor, largely um, uh, minorities, Mm-hmm. There are many states where I guarantee you those governors didn't give a shit about that because of that. And I can tell you that because I saw that with leadership during the HIV crisis, where the people who were struck by that were also minorities. They were gay men in Africa. They were Africans. They were black people. Mm-hmm. There was this point you made earlier about, Mary, about blaming people for their illness by virtue of, I forgot the word you used, but some sort of you know irresponsibility. And they could shrug it off. They didn't care about them. They weren't voters they cared about. They didn't have the circle of empathy to them. I, I am sure that we've had governors who felt similarly and thereby that's part of why their response was so silly and contrast that with the conversation I had with my friend in Australia yesterday. They are still on real lockdown, yeah. like real lockdown. Yeah. And, and they have a tiny number of cases and tiny number of deaths and they all know why, right? They have a stated plan. They want it. They just want to have minimal death. They're able to keep their economy kind of humming along. They're doing all right, but they want to have minimal death. And, and the whole country knows at least what the leadership wants. Same with New Zealand and lots of other countries. In this country, we didn't know what we were aiming for. And I'll, that's back to your question about Afghanistan. We didn't get on board with a shared goal. We didn't see the benefits. We weren't told the stories. And instead, we just had too many plans without any grand shared idea of what we were aiming for. You know, RP, when you were talking about the, you know, we thought it was those people who were going to die. It looked like, you know, the cities were the front door, right? That's where our transport hubs are. And um, and we the racial ethnic disparities became rapidly apparent. That created a, a huge vulnerability. I, I have a student who's been working with me who's who looked at nursing home deaths because most of the deaths, as you've also said, were among older people. And, uh, but as this virus moved, as they do, uh, to the heartland, um, there was a racial crossover in nursing home deaths. Uh, So it was, you know, as it turns out, um, you know, the occupants of nursing homes are are disproportionately white, not, uh, and, uh, you know, this notion that there was some kind of protection because of some inherent, quality of being white, um, you know, was dangerous and, uh, and, and meant that, 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 that people didn't understand the need to take action uh, because they thought it was those people uh, who, who would get sick. I think sick. that's a great, a great point. And no schadenfreude and no joy in noting that with the 
March of Delta through many of the southern states, yeah. we're seeing an increased number of white men dying now, too. And again, these are all tragedies, but they're avoidable. Yeah. And then we see people like Joe Rogan, who you may not know or may know is the most popular podcast in America. No. I didn't. And he the numbers are astonishing. And he <laughs> goes on his podcast, he diminishes vaccines. He just got COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And he gets on screen and says he's taking ivermectin, which is now well named as horse paste, and um, and that he's feeling better um, and continuing to undermine, you know, a, a chance for him to really take a leadership role here. Um, and 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 this is in light of of health experts like you who have decades and decades of experience, multiple degrees from multiple universities and leadership in this in your fairly rare instance in multiple countries. Mm-hmm. Um, are now part of this uh, uh, distrusted, apparently, you know, you're part of some elite cabal that's trying to do something evil to us. And, um, and, and, and I guess you've spent your whole career working for Microsoft, selling microchips for tracking or something, or you've got a patent on some disease product, or, you know, there's, there's personal wealth here at the end for you. And, and um, as we can tell by you, $200 a month in Zimbabwe, which I'm sure you just pocketed. So, you know, it's shocking how we're looking at this reality right now. Well, Are people I, trying to help. Yeah, uh, it's somehow become uh, there's a, a section of people who won't get vaccinated who it's become part of their identity statement. Yeah. Right? They're like, I'm no one's ever going to talk me out of this, but I, I'm hopeful that a, a fair portion of people uh, will we'll see that they've just got to get vaccinated. And um, I, 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 um, I, let me ask you that, Mary. Um, how do you, what, what, you're probably pretty familiar with the group of people who aren't getting vaccinated. And, yeah. and there's, you know, 13% of America is never going to get vaccinated. They're similar to the anti childhood vax folks. There's another 14, now 13% of Americans who are like looking for quote unquote more information. I think those, those are the folks that are beginning to get it wrapped up in their identity too. And they like to be different and I, you know, whatever. What cohort do you think you can speak best to about why they should consider getting vaccinated? And what do you say to them? Well, I, what I, this is what I'm getting ready to try because I'm, I'm, uh, I work with some colleagues who work in, among people who are formerly incarcerated, where interestingly, there's similarly a resistance to authority and getting vaccinated and uh, distrust. And I'm, I'm going to try saying that this Delta variant and others that are coming, there's one called Lambda, uh, that's out Delta there. Plus. Yeah. And there's hybrid, you know, combinations of Lambda and Delta characteristics and that these are different and they're dangerous. That we need to, you know, everybody needs to kind of do a reset and um, acknowledge that, uh, that we're in different territory. With Delta, um, it was hard enough to get your head around the idea of exponential spread, right? All of us have trouble with that. Yeah, I said yeah, the yeah. first- This is our death, first conversation, Tom. Yeah, uh, the first death in late February, um, and now we're up to 650,000 deaths. How did that happen? And as you remember, it just zips right up. Well, with this, uh, this Delta variant, it's even worse. Uh, 10 cycles of the original one, takes you from one to something under 10,000 infections. 10 cycles of Delta takes you from one to 60 million uh, in a susceptible population. This is different and dangerous. And we, you know, we need to do, uh, everybody needs to do a reset, protect yourself, uh, protect your children who aren't eligible to get vaccinated protect elders who, for whom vaccine uh, protectiveness uh, may decline faster than it does for other people. I'll let you know. I don't- Yeah, you know. please. We're, <laughs> we're working on something like that this weekend. I like, I like, I got some good stuff from you there. Thank you. You know, I think some of these things as you, as you talk about them, um, you know, you were outlining RP and I, I had sort of highlighted it as well, that like one is what is the plan? And then two is how do you communicate the plan? Two is really hard, mm-hmm. right? In this world today, you could have the greatest plan in the world and getting someone to know it, man, is that hard. But here's what I'm appreciating, at least at this moment. 
and I don't know enough about the CDC to say, right? You guys would know this far better than I, or any other government entity that might play a role here. Um, we need people like you guys coming up with your own ideas to do the right thing because it's just it's all happening in real time and like this this transmissibility of the delta variant just for example i mean people just got to do they believe in masks or not you know and now we're on to like uh oh delta variant's got a whole new set of things that makes this more challenging and by the way i keep thinking about Lori garrett rp yeah. Lori garrett who said this thing's coming and it's never going away i'm more and more i'm like Oh, man, because I had sort of sold her out. I thought, oh, Lori Garrett's wrong. And more Lori and more. Lori Garrett's I'm never wrong. She's never wrong. <laughs> I'm telling you. Mary, yeah. she's in our book. She's our Cassandra you for the I mean? pandemic. She oh, used yeah. to pass through Zimbabwe. And I, I used to, you know, she was my my favorite rant and rave person. Yeah. She's still, well, so, but she's, we need people like you guys to try things like you're trying. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. so important. You know, I just read I forget the name of the book exactly. Maybe it's called Lies or Truth or whatever. And it's uh, what's the guy's name? Um, uh, I can't think of his name. The smart guy. Anyway, he the wrote a book. On, <laughs> what, what, what's his name? Did you say his name? I forget his name. Come on, Dan, you know the name. Um, anyway, he wrote a book on lying or telling the truth. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, this distrust. Yeah. Yeah is coming and, to roost just, yeah that's the currency of public health by the yes, way yes yes and, and it, it goes uh, back to and, and when you lose it you have a big problem wait but okay it's, it's and, more than public health yeah right it's a isn't i i yeah. was talking to a, a great friend of mine yesterday and i don't think he watches the show so um isn't currency yes pardon me isn't trust the thing trust is the coin of the realm of humanity yeah and Trust across our different revolutions, industrial revolutions and growth. Trust is one thing that allowed us to grow. Mm -hmm. And trust is without trust, we become just clearly the most dangerous animal in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, trust is everything. everything. Yeah. By the way, it's Sam Harris and it's called lying. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you read the book and he's like he basically makes the the. the I've never done every everything on the up and up. I haven't. Like, I, I got to be frank. I'm not sure any one of us has pulled this one off as effectively as maybe we wish we had. Right. But by and large, as I hear you guys just, you know, discussing this, this challenge. I don't know how you solve that one. Like that one's hard. And that's that's what you're doing with the formerly or maybe the currently incarcerated. And RP, that's what you're going to be doing on Saturday with with some of our guys. Um, Mary, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one thing that I've had some success with in this conversation. So I have a whole, I have a group of friends from eighth grade. We all played football together mm -hmm. and we're still in a group chat. And there's you know, about 30 of us in that chat and in the periphery, you know, and initially six, then five, then four, then three. And I think now one person in that group has refused to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And I've offered to talk to all of them and tell them, you know, I, w I looked at all these things very skeptically. Here's what I came up with. I vaccinated myself and my kids. And, you know, I try to use a scientific method and I try to be skeptical and I don't trust these answers either. And blah, blah, blah that gets me nowhere. And what I was able to say to them was, um, you know, I used to work briefly, but a bit with a guy named Tony Fauci, 1995. Mm -hmm. I used to work with a guy named Ken Bernard. To this day, I still do. And Howie Foreman and, you know, to a little bit with Paul Offit and, and like the, the voices you're hearing about these things. And let me just tell you who these people are, right? Like, like if they were in, if they were in our eighth grade football team, that would be the one person we're most proud of and we love. And we would talk to you about our mom and their mom and they would be taking care of us. These are like saints, mm -hmm. you know, and when you work with them personally and look at Mary Bassett working in Zimbabwe, right? Like for $200 a month, <laughs> like, couldn't she have come to New York City and I don't uh, and been an, an, an internal medicine doctor and made two hundred thousand dollars a year? Of course she could have, but she didn't. Why? Mm -hmm. I don't think she. You know, maybe she loved to see Vic Falls. You know, once every six months, but she wasn't there for the last while yeah. she was there. Like these people are saints, and somehow when I can say to them again, it gets the Dunbar's number. I know that person, and I can tell you that's a good person. Okay, well I trust you. I trust them. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I think that a lot of people have noticed this, which is why we hear from from uh, Dr. Fauci a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll try that, too. I, I, um, 
I, I'm perplexed by it. Not, I think not everyone will we be able to convince, but the other, you know, we're at like something over 50, just over 50% of, of people fully vaccinated. And 49. that's- 49.6. Huh? 49.6 yesterday, I think, something like Is that. Is that right? Yeah. I think so, we're quite, if we're just over 50, just, great. That'd be you worth know, noting. So it, that's not good enough. Mm. And when you have something as contagious as Delta, it's really not good enough. We need to get much higher. And so I, I'll try the, this is a really smart person, listen to, listen. No, uh, a good person. A really good person. That's different. The, the story right. that I, there yeah, is a, a woman I worked with at UNAIDS. And yeah. when she came back to yeah. headquarters, she had just left the field where she had been stood in. She, she was literally a group. You probably know the story. There was four or five of them that a group of gorillas pinned them up against a truck and murdered four of them with an AK-47 and left her alive. And one of them was her yeah. husband. And then yeah. sent her back. She was an in the field public health worker. That's who these people are. That's who you are. Wow. And they are they are good, big hearted people simply trying to save lives at great personal cost. Right. And of course, then you have the inexcusable crime of the governor of Texas, uh, Florida, talking about Fauciism as if it's fascism with a picture of him in a brown shirt. Okay. And what in the world? Uh. Yeah. The governor of Florida, not some loon. I mean, he is a loon, but not some loon on their website or on a YouTube channel. I mean, that this, this is so dangerous. Um, you, you know, I mean, summer, we've been protected by people being outdoors. Uh, winter's coming. Uh, you know, I'm such a dummy because I saw the Joe Rogan thing, RP, and, and I kind of picked up the ivermectin and all that, but I hadn't sort of thought of it as like a juxtaposition to the vaccine. Is he not vaccinated? Is that what he's saying? I don't, I don't know if he is. Well, because he, he didn't say been. one way or another. And I'm thinking like, well, you don't need all that shit. You're vaccinated. But I don't know. I don't know if he is or he isn't. Well, I, I know that he's said a lot of, he hasn't said any clearly anti-vax things. Just um, but he said a lot of, he's a vaccine skeptic and he's, He's talked about how, so I think he's not vaccinated, but he said a lot of things about how, look, let's just be, let's just call, let's just be honest about this, right? COVID-19 kills. What are we at? Where are we at now? I forgot what the CFR is, but it's like, you know, 99% of people who get the disease won't die. Something like that, right? I don't know what the number is. And, and if you don't understand that a lot doesn't mean every, and that always doesn't mean many times. Like if you don't understand the difference between 99% and a ton, and 700,000 Americans already dead, then you can beat Joe Rogan and say, hey, 99% of people survive. And, you know, 400 people under 40 have died or you know, it's 400 right. people under, like he's right, right? But that's not the point. So yeah, no, I there's mean, actually a risk. video, sorry, go ahead. I mean, most risks, uh, you know, exactly. Are, are right. Rare. What's your chance of dying in a car crash every day right. that you should put your seatbelt on? Right. Before we go, because we are we are short on time. Um, give me a little more. Give us a little more. I want to hear just a little bit more on your optimism. You yeah, never thanks, really yes, finished please. that. Point. Mary, will you please? Dr. Bassett, please, please, please. Sure. Uh, well, I'm really talking about the enduring uh, racial and ethnic disparities personally, since I I, uh, I know most about black white uh, disparities and there's been a difference in life expectancy ever since data has been collected on it. The, the gap has narrowed, but it's never gone away and COVID has made it larger. There's uh, going to be a, a, a three year loss of life expectancy among African Americans, uh, mainly because people are not only dying at higher rates, but at younger ages. And, uh, and so that the likelihood is that we'll see um, not only, um, you know, a, rise, a, a decline in life expectancy, which by the way, in the United States has been going down for a couple of years now, not by much, but now there, there's, it's going to be by more, but the racial gap will widen. But we're hearing a conversation now about racism in the United States. I used to feel that I was being really brave as health commissioner by using the word racism because it, that sounded like a political slogan to people. 
not like, um, you know, something that describes our society. But we live in a, in a society which has had a racial hierarchy for centuries. And it costs lives, not just of people at the bottom of the racial hierarchy. It has to do with the fact that in general, white Americans also are experiencing a decline in life expectancy. So, you know, it, it is a threat to our entire society. And we have a conversation that's taking place now that didn't happen before. And we have a willingness in the private sector, in academia, in government, uh, to talk about this as, a, as an issue that, that we as a country must solve. So that makes me, that makes me optimistic. That's great to hear. And, and all of that it makes does. sense to me. I mean, it, 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 um, we've actually talked about this a fair amount. I mean, we, we did a trip last year. Um, we went from here to the northern tip of the Mississippi, all the way down the Mississippi and back. And we, wow. it was right I've after George Floyd. And we had yeah. conversations on race the whole way. And it was intense, very intense. However, the participation, the commitment, the willingness was mm -hmm. very high yeah. and it made me feel great. I thought, okay, this hurts, but man, are we all, we all are seemingly engaged in something that we were not as engaged with before. It's unfortunate that it has to come on the heels of bad things, but that's history kind of proves that out. That's how these things tend to go sadly. Um, and tends to be the kinds of things that get, gets people and you know, humans to react. I think a lot of what you just said about, um, RP, you referred to it earlier, but this, whatever word you used, irresponsibility, lack of responsibility, personal responsibility, and how COVID unveiled a, 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 a clearer truth is powerful and helpful and, and, you know, something to feel good about. So I am glad that you brought that up. And I'm glad you feel that way more than anything else that you feel that way. I you and I don't know each other very well, but it makes me feel better. So I'm glad to hear that. I do. Um, Anything before we go, guys? It's two twenty-seven, and we've we've got to go. I put. Let, there, no, it's a, really fun talking with you all. I hope you have fun like this every time you get together and talk. Well, it's more fun with you, Mary. But um, <laughs> the I just put a, a link in, and and I'm not I'm not condoning everything in this video at all. But it's okay. Bill Burr, who's the the bald comedian from Massachusetts, and Joe Rogan where Bill Burr is kind of ripping on Joe Rogan, the world's number one podcaster for like, stop being such a fake tough guy with masks used to wear masks. You've got the whole world now thinking wearing a mask is on macho oh, talking about vaccine. It's, it's interesting. And, 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 you know, Joe Rogan, look, I, I'm sure this is super rude for me to say, but take a look at his face and tell me the guy's not jacked up on steroids, first of all. So, uh, you know, but you know, they're sitting there puff, puffing cigars. It's a 10 minute clip. Let's put it into the, into the episode, uh, put it up on the, on the site. Cause I think it's interesting to watch someone, you know, in comedian language, push back at Joe Rogan on some of his dangerous bullshit. And he had the chance and now they got COVID to, to circle back around on that and tell us all he was silly. He's gonna wear a mask cause he did feel shitty for a couple of days, but instead he's taking ivermectin and what a, what a jerk. <laughs> So. That really is silly. Uh, well, doesn't make sense, but I guess doesn't that makes sense. I mean, ivermectin was a great thing in Zimbabwe. I'm sure it's a beautiful well, drug I mean, for it's, many it's, things, it's, right? It's a great story. I mean, it's it, the river blindness story. Something called river blindness and yeah. Merck, which developed and it's used mainly as a veterinary drug, yeah. decided that they would simply give it away for human yeah. use and. Uh, so it's an exam. It's a, a wonderful example. It has nothing to do with COVID. My right. goodness. Uh, That's Dr. That. Mary Bassett telling you, do not take horse paste for COVID. <laughs> all right. Thank okay. you so much, Thank Dr. You. Dr. Thank nice you all. You. So long, everybody. Thanks, Tom.